Hello? <laughs> All right, are we? Okay, before I just want to thank you, Bless. There was a theme of awesomeness there, and I think we all know how God is awesome. And then Eric, clear and safe moving forward. I think you'll see some harmonies here uh, in the sermon here. Get your feet in the right place. You have to move forward, but you may not know exactly where you're going, but God always catches us. So you want to record now? <laughs> it's recording. Oh, it's recording. All right. Any handouts? <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. Not this time. Oh. The title of this sermon is Foreclosure Legacy Jubilee. You probably might think Jubilee, foreclosure. How are those related? So I have the greatest nightmare. I think I mentioned that to you. No one wants to hear that their family land is up for foreclosure auction. That is not a good place. It's not where any family wants to be, but there are many that obviously go through it, as I learned. So, the Monticello newspaper <laughs> announced, Monticello, Georgia, that is, announced that a piece of land that's in my family, was up for foreclosure. By the way, they're all publicly noted that any foreclosure auction is publicly announced. So this is no surprise. Nobody should be like, oh, it's it. No one knows. Unless you're calling me all the papers in all the United States, you might not know, but it's clear. So what is a tax lien foreclosure? A tax lien foreclosure is the sale of property resulting from the property owner's failure to pay their tax liabilities. A lien is placed on the property because the owner or whoever holding it didn't pay the required taxes. That's what happened to this particular property. And you get a listing of all the details, the parcel, the lot, the current record holder, Jim Holland estate and all heirs known and unknown. Defendant, well, tax years, a couple of them. The deed book, not found. Wait a minute. If, if you're probably wondering, how the heck can the tax commissioner be collecting tax on a deed that they can't find? They can't find it. But of course, at one point, this land obviously had a deed because they started collecting taxes. Legal description, their description, where it is, being found here in this county, Georgia, so many acres, possible street. Notice there's no address. It's just a street because there was no home on this property. That's my family property. Up for tax closure. Let's talk about land. Seems to be pretty important, right? It was. The Lord started Land started with the God, the creator and supreme landowner with the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2.15. The Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. God is the owner of all things. Just as the land in Israel belongs to God, so everything in the world belongs to God. I think we all know that. Since God is the owner, we are the stewards. Stewardship is Christian life, right? We're stewarding this, children, your stewards here. We're stewarding all over the place. And in 1 Peter 4.10, it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. No one knows exactly what form you'll need to be using these gifts to be stewards, but you are, as I mean. But God is also the savior of his people. But guess what? God is the God of second chances. He gives us all second chances. And this is the heart of the law 
of the year of Jubilee. So what is the law of the year of Jubilee? The word Jubilee literally means ram's horn in Hebrew, and it's divine in Leviticus 25.9 as the sabbatical year after seven cycles of seven years, 49 plus that zero year, you get 50. And it's a celebration. The ram's horn was blown on the 10th day of the seventh month to start the 50th year of universal redemption. The year of Jubilee involves a year of release from indebtedness, from all types of bondage. All prisoners and captives were set free. All slaves were released. All debts were forgiven. And all property was returned to its original owners. Something I was hoping for here. One of the benefits of Jubilee was that both the land and the people were able to rest. Every 50th year, God saw to it that every single person among his people would get a second chance. We are the recipients of this extravagant grace. God provided a way for us to get a second chance. Now, I don't know if many of you have read Leviticus. Many of us here in this fellowship have combed over Leviticus in many various ways, in all kinds of forms, correct and wrong, right? So if this is not a book that you are well knowledge in, you might want to begin some study, but it is quite hefty. I don't think this is like the beginner's first book that they should start with. <laughs> so now let's talk about the land restoration that's found in Leviticus 25. Since the Lord is the supreme landowner, he alone determines its disposal and retrieval. And there are verses about it here in 20, verse 23 and 24. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, Lord God is saying, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. It's not yours, it's mine. Throughout the land that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. So you're probably thinking, what's, what's all this land restoration that Connie's talking about here? Why is it so important? How do we get anything back that we've lost? It's in the law. Now let's talk about some legacy myths. Because there are many of them. I had them. One myth is you gotta be rich to leave a legacy. Nah. Historically, when we think of legacy, we tend to think of it as the amount of money will lead to our heirs. Money is the easiest kind of legacy to leave, but it's generally the least valuable. I know you're probably thinking that's odd. Legacy is for the famous. The rich and famous can only leave a legacy. Now, nah, that's a myth too. Just because you are not in the history books doesn't mean that you don't have a legacy. Everyone will leave a legacy, whether it's good or bad. All of us are leaving legacies. I see it with my nieces and nephews, my brothers and sisters, what they've done or haven't done. They're leaving a legacy. It might not be the one they want, but they're leaving one. My parents have left me with a legacy. I think you're benefiting. Legacy is cast in stone. Now, that's a myth too. There's some who give up the ideal of legacy. They see a hopeless past or perhaps a hopeless future. The legacies can be remade. Second chance. Legacy is not about having a perfect record. It's not about the swashbuckling hero which proclaims victory before the battle. Legacy is about faithfulness, even in the midst of failure. Climbing a rock, my foot slipped, did I hold on? 
It's proceeding, proceeding, even when the feelings aren't there. I had no feelings to go redeem this land. Not at all. None. Every one of us is building a legacy, an imperfect legacy. We're human. We're imperfect. But there's hope because God uses broken vessels. He is able to bring good out of the messes we get into. Our God is a God of second chances. It's called forgiveness. Let's get to the details. This legacy in me. Once you get through all the legalese, <laughs> and you, 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 you go down to a little part that says, who signed this thing? Who is the grantor? Who is the grantee? Who, is, who owns it? Who gave it up? And when did they do it? This deed was signed November 5th, 1942. My father's name is there. My mother's father's name is there. And then I think my mother's father's brother's name is there. But notice there's no women's name there. There's no women's names listed there. There are women, but they're not listed there. I believe at this time, women could not own property. Let alone a black person. Hmm. Let alone a black woman <laughs> owning property at this time. But by the way, at this time, there were still white sections and black sections and things like this. And in this particular town, I believed when I talked to my brother, he said, they thought, ah, yeah, sign them, the, sign them the property. They won't be able to keep it up because guess what? Black folks don't keep it up. They don't pay for it. They don't do anything, et cetera. That's what, they, that's what the owners thought. This person by the name of whoever gave it to my family. So this is my legacy, right? Found. I'll get to that in a moment about lost and found. Legacy's purpose. It's in Proverbs 13, 22. It says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. This verse keeps our life goals, our vision, and our legacy front and center when we're choosing how to use our money today. I had to do put out some money to go back and get this land, right? I could have used it on, I don't know, in the coat, some shoes, I don't know. I could have used that money very differently. When we weigh what we want now against what we really want later, we realize how temporary satisfaction pales in comparison to a legacy of purpose and generational fulfillment. An inheritance is not limited to money. It also includes godly character, qualities like integrity and trustworthiness. Combining a financial inheritance with wisdom and godliness ensures that the next generation, hello, William and Jamie, <laughs> will also manage God's blessings that are give glory long after we've graduated to heaven. We all graduate, folks. We're just in high school right now. <laughs> Well, let's talk about this lost legacy that was found. There's lots of ver ver I found scriptures on this, so just look at the pictures here. So that's me in front of the Jasper County Courthouse on the front steps in Jasper County. So where is Jasper County in this great state of Georgia? It's midway, mid-center, you'll find Monticello. I've only been there a couple times when I was little. Never really had a reason to go. Nothing really much there. The place looks like Mayberry or Back to the Future. <laughs> There's a Confederate statue of soldiers in the center of the town. Wow, here I am in New England. And like, wow, we don't have any Confederate soldiers, you know, or statues and things. But, you know, going in there, you know where we are, the heart of the Confederate land. Ah, oh, but that's a past, right? Proverbs 15, 22 says, without counsel, plans fail, with many advisors that succeed. 
I'm going to mention some family names, but I'm not going to mention their names because they like privacy and this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be on YouTube for forever. 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 And even somebody deletes it, somebody can probably find it. But I want to thank my wise counsel from my brothers. They did not want this land for whatever reason. It is not mine to judge their motives, but they didn't want it, even though they were born there. But they said, Connie, if you want it, we will not stop you. Because they could. Your family members, right? My other sister, I have two sisters alive, one dead. The, the dead sister actually, I think, tried to do this process. And probably the information we have today is thanks to her. I have another brother kind of in and out of whatever. And through my uh, sister that I've been, the oldest sister, she's the one kind of keeps connections going. So I want to thank my brothers and sisters for helping. One brother actually came down and was beside me when I bid on the property. And they also offered up some financial help. Drew came down and helped using her paralegal skills. I know how to find deeds. <laughs> we went into the D room an hour before because you saw in the, the newsletter, it said D not sound. I'm like, what do you mean? I got the D right here. <laughs> but they couldn't find it. And there's a process. They actually have people they pay to find these things. I'm like, you pay people to find things and they don't find them, but I just found it. <laughs> what, what is this? We go into this room. This is a very small courthouse, by the way. You turn left, you get your birth certificate. You turn right, you get your deed from your property. You go forward, and there's the tax commissioner. You go, you go out the front door, and boom, there you are. So this isn't a big place. This is a small place, and they all know each other. I'm sure there's incest all over that place. But <laughs> it's being recorded. <laughs> Sarah, please edit that out. Um, but about a half an hour before the whole thing was going to happen, on the front steps, by the way, they've been doing this forever, on the front steps, outside. You're like, in this day and age, electronics and so on, blah, blah. we're doing this on the front steps of the courthouse. Yeah. Wow. Every year, right outside, rain or shine, that's what they told me, we do the auction. And all I could think of was property. Was there ever a slave person on these steps here being auctioned off at some point? Let's put that to the side. So we went into the deed room. Thank you, Drew. And we went to somebody who was there and we said, uh, we're looking, how do you help, help us find these deeds? He says, I never go back there. <laughs> you work in this place? <laughs> no, I never go back there. If it's, if it's not digitized, and they only digitize certain things, so this wasn't worthy of being digitized. Um, you know, I'm like, what if this place burns down? So there's a room full of, you, you feel like you went into this like ancient, you know, treasure trove of books. There's books from the ceiling to the bottom, and, and you know, thick, thick books and everything handwritten. And Drew just, Drew's in her element. She just zooms right in there, and we start tearing through, and that's why you find this page here. You find this page, right, handwritten, Somebody dutifully wrote on this day, this happened, blah, 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 blah. Long, a long time ago. So without council plans fail, with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 28, do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. I haven't quite explored that scripture, but I think there's something in there. Numbers 27, 8. Further, you shall speak to your sons of Israel, saying, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. Hey, I'm a daughter. Numbers 33, 54. You shall inherit the land by lot, according to your families, to the larger, blah, 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 blah. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. And then the one 
that cinched it later for me. You have to understand, I'm on this journey and I don't have a clue I'm on a journey. God's got me on a journey and I have no clue. Le Leviticus 20, 25, 29, 30 was the one that just sealed the deal for me because it says, if a man sells the dwelling in a walled city, he may redeem it within a year of its sale. Now, I've been talking to the tax commissioner now for a couple months, and she said, well, at the auction, you know, they're telling me the timeline and telling me stuff and stuff I don't understand. And then finally she says, well, after the tax, we indeed get you get it. You have a year and a day to redeem it. I'm like, what? I'm like, my goodness, they're using laws today that are taken from the Bible. So people who are like, I don't believe in the Bible, I don't believe in any of this stuff, you are just delusional. Our world, our laws are based off of something. The Greek, Roman, or the Bible. Here it is right here. And guess what? The word that is used is ribbon of redemption. That shocks me. But here, in today, 2021, we're using words that come right out of the Bible. And if it's not redeemed within a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong in perpetuity to the buyer. That's exactly what they told me. Honey, they said, in a year and a day, it will be yours. No one can take it away from you. It's yours. And in this case, the verse says, it shall not be released in the Jubilee. It's mine. A legacy lost and found. Now let's talk about kinsman redeemer. Didn't know this was what was going on, folks. Still, we're in Leviticus, that big, juicy book of the Bible. Leviticus 25, 25. If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. You might be thinking for the literal, this has to do with tax lien. Well, something was sold. Something was lost. Somebody's trying to redeem it, which was me. What are the requirements to be a kinsman redeemer? One, you had to be a kin. The only way a kinsman redeemer you could be one is that you had to be of the same family. They had to be some relational tie. Think of it as some kind of, oh, heck, kind, kin. Okay, that makes sense. Someone from another family could not bring about the redemption because they were of a different kind. Two, you had to be willing. We all know the Ruth and Boaz story, right? Yeah. Probably most of us, that's where you think of kinsman redeemer. But let's be broadening here, right? That the person, the next redeemer in line, was simply not willing to go through with the redemption. He said, no, I'm not. If I marry Ruth, I'll, I'm going to mess up my whole other stuff and whatnot. That person said no. So someone else had to step in. So if the person is not willing, by the way, and they could not be forced to do it, being willing is at the heart of what is the kinsman redeemer. Three, you have to be able to redeem Willingness are known because my sister passed. She was willing, but not able. She didn't have all the steps here to be able to do this. You actually had to follow through. Follow through. Move forward. Take the next step. If you did not have the financial means to make the redemption, then you, you could not be the redeemer. It did not matter how good your intentions were. And you had to pay the price in full. They would not take an online payment. They would not take a credit card. They would not take a promissory note. <laughs> they wanted either cash or a bank check. 
installment. <laughs> they did not do installments. <laughs> you had to pay full. Oh. What about me? I was a kin. I was willing. I was able to redeem. And I could pay. Redeeming a legacy. The year of Jubilee has the number seven in it a lot of times. And when you study the good Leviticus and all that, you find, hey, these numbers have something. Three, the Trinity, seven, completeness. They come up lots of times. I won't get into numerology. Don't, let's not go there. But certain numbers do show up prominently, and they do in the year of Jubilee. The redemption of land is part of the law of Jubilee. It dawned on me that I was the seventh child. The last child of my parents. Maybe the Lord was saying, all this stuff that happened before, it wasn't theirs to do. It was yours to come back and redeem for your brothers and sisters. I'm like, what am I, Joseph? No, I am not Joseph. <laughs> Come on, guys, I am not a Delta. Just the seventh child in 2021, feeling motivated to do something and doesn't know why. I was kin, definitely willing and able, and I could pay those back taxes. By the way, it was interesting because Drew was there and she loved the whole process. <laughs> Y'all should process. I hated the whole thing, but she was just like, woo! Woo! It's getting hot in here. Woo! <laughs> there was property there that had back taxes of like $295 that went for $15,000. Who in the heck would bid it up like that? It was sort of like the person was like, I want this property, and bam! I'm going to stop all of the bids. Just stop all of them. And everybody just got it. I hated that process. And then there was, understand, the devil is there. When you are trying to do something for God, do not think the devil is not there. It may be subtle, it may be blatant, but the devil was there, and I met the devil. The person there didn't buy anything, had no purpose, didn't want anything, was bidding everything up. So I knew the devil was there because the devil wants to be there. I want to block all the good things that God wants. At the start of this process, I had no idea what was going on. God doesn't come and tell you, so Connie, let's have a talk. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on, and I'm going to lay it out for you, and here's all that's going to happen. No, that's not how it works. So anybody who thinks that's how it happens, it does not. The Lord does not, like, just lay it all out there for you. I think there's fun in the learning, in the process. I wouldn't be able to do this if I had known that all from. Divine providence was at work. God knew what I did not know, that I was meant to redeem this property. God was giving our family a second chance, and he decided that I was the one to do it. That is all it is. There's no grand and glorious thing. I'm not greater than anybody else. I'm just the chosen vessel at the time. God uses and picks whoever he wants to do whatever he wants for his greater will. That's all it is. No I need to get my head blown up. That's not the point. God is the point. Jesus is the point. I am the kinsman redeemer in this situation, and I was meant to reestablish this family legacy with this property. The birth home of my older brothers and sisters was meant to be redeemed. That's the point. The Lord revealed to me in a personal way what it means to be a kinsman redeemer. So here I am walking the land. I have a little video, it's about one minute, but hey, you can get that on here. So we started one in, and I pushed Drew out the way because she was blocking the phone. <laughs> and we walked. Good land. Big land. One side, there's this beautiful home. I mean, a typical, you know, one level home. And the other end, there was a dump. And in the land, somebody threw a old toilet commode in the center. 
my brother said, oh, yeah, we cleaned this out 20 years ago. We OK, fine. But you know, the earth takes over. <laughs> the earth will take over, grow up. We, 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 you won't even recognize it. Like, so we walked the land. And at that moment, I could see the dot connect physically. So let's close it out here. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. We know what you had to be, but how did Jesus do it? Jesus became like us because the redeemer had to be of like kind. Jesus had to be like us. If Jesus did not take on humanity, there would be no way of redemption for us. Since sin came through the world through one man, it would take another man, second chance, to bring about our salvation and righteousness. This would require the infinite God to take on human flesh and to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. He was willing to do it. Jesus gave up his life as a sacrifice of his own free will. No one twisted his arm to do it. He was willing to be obedient and see this process all the way to the end. I, too, was going to follow wherever the rabbit hole led to get that family property back. That's what Jesus did with the triune God. There was no question we were going to be redeemed. God knew we were going to be redeemed. Jesus was able to redeem us. Having the willingness, as we said earlier, means nothing if you're not able to do it. No one else could come and do this redeeming of us. The death and the obedience of Jesus was everything they needed to bring out the redemption. Jesus is a family. It's not about the I. It's the we. It's the us. So when people think, oh, it's all about me and what I want. No. We are all interrelated with each other. I need you to survive. Consequently, just one trespass resulted in the condemnation of all people. So also one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for all people. Just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, we have all been made righteousness, Romans 5, 18, 19. Jesus paid the complete price for our sin. At that auction, someone was giving up my property, had no business, and the tax commissioner stood in and said, this is family property. Why are you bidding on this? You don't want it. You have no need for it, and you don't even know where it is. Jesus paid the full price. No one could overbid Jesus' bid to redeem us and pay the price. Jesus paid the full, ultimate price. There was no debate. On Titus 2.14, it says, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed of doing good deeds by little deed. Jesus paid it all once and for all. When we think about the kinsman redeemer, it's all about what was lost and found. We were lost on the verge of losing everything, but Jesus stepped in. He restored what was lost and gave us a new identity in Christ. The beautiful thing here is we never have to worry about having to be redeemed again. Jesus paid the price redemption once and for all. So to close, I thank Lord and I hope you thank Lord with me 
for showing us in a very personable, tangible way what it really means to retain a family legacy and be a kinsman redeemer. Thank you, guys.